Good evening, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of all of us at the locally based, independently owned bookstore, Books and Books in Miami, Florida, in partnership with the Miami Book Fair, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual afternoon with Christine Madrid French to discuss her new book, The Architecture of Suspense, The Built World in the Films of Alfred Hitchcock, published by University of Virginia Press. Christine Madrid French, a native of Los Angeles, is a historian, author, and screenwriter specializing in architecture, Hollywood, and film. Just a quick reminder that throughout this evening's broadcast, you can post questions below in the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen. I encourage you to support Christine and Books and Books and order your copy of The Architecture of Suspense today from the link at the bottom of your screen. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Sebastian, for that really great introduction. I'm here at the Haas Lilienthal House in San Francisco, and CEO of San Francisco Heritage, Carolyn Monte, is here with me. Hey, Carolyn. Hi. Hello, everyone. We wanted to uh, come from here because it's an actual haunted house in San Francisco, and we have an event here called Mayhem Mansion. And I brought my knife. If you see my social, I usually have a big old knife. Uh, so Carolyn and I are just going to be discussing the architecture of suspense and the places where you can go in real life to find some of that suspense that you see on film. So Carolyn, did you want to talk about San Francisco Heritage real quick? Sure. Thanks for the opportunity. So San Francisco Heritage is a nonprofit really focused on safeguarding the places that make San Francisco special. So whether that be historic landmark buildings or cultural districts, we're really focusing on working with communities to identify the places that are special to them in their neighborhoods and advocating on behalf of them and with them to ensure their safeguarding. One of our special, um, most widely loved programs is the Legacy Business Programs. We're really focusing on restaurants, bars, and businesses that Book are stores. Over, and bookstores. Stores. A lot of bookstores are included that make uh, neighborhoods in San Francisco such a special place to live. Yes, and I just got a job here as the Director of Advocacy and Programs. So I'm going to be working in San Francisco. If you've been following me, you know I've been all over the country this month. I'm going to be in San Francisco working right here at this haunted mansion. And I have a little surprise we wanted to show you. We're in the nursery right now. And this little baby says, please read some Hitchcock and visit your historic sites. So um, let's get started about the architecture of suspense. Um, Carolyn, you were going to maybe have a couple questions, right? Yeah, well, I'm so happy to have you join us at San Francisco Heritage. We're really honored to have you be a voice of our organization, but I'm really interested in learning more about what got you interested in writing. And if you could tell us a little bit more about your new book. Sure, uh, thanks. So it is about Alfred Hitchcock and architecture. And what got me started in the topic was actually historic preservation. So I would be spending a lot of time in buildings and trying to advocate on their behalf uh, for the public. In Miami, you have so many great buildings, like let's say the Bacardi building, you're at the Bacardi building. And you're trying to get people to understand the structure. What I found is I had so many lessons from Hollywood about how you can story tell around buildings. So when you start telling a story about a structure, people want to go, they make pilgrimages. Um, like what's your favorite Hitchcock movie? Definitely Vertigo. Oh geez, Vertigo. Okay, well we're in uh, Hitchcock City, he loves San Francisco. And if you've seen Vertigo, it's a more of a, a mystery of you know identity. Uh, which Hitchcock used identity a lot in his movies to build suspense. So you don't ever really know who you are or where you're at. So even in North by Northwest, the, the lead character um, becomes, uh, he loses his identity. And he is accidentally, he's accused in a, in a setup murder at the United Nations. So when we're talking about architecture of suspense, we're looking at maybe deadly skyscrapers. And the skyscraper for Hitchcock was a place where you could maintain, and the city of San Francisco, where you were strangely anonymous, but um, so you lose your identity inside the city. And you can see that even in rear window. Uh, so in rear window, you know, everybody's, all the neighbors are, are nosing into each other's business, but then inside their own apartments, they feel like nobody else can see them. And it's such an interesting uh, facet of how you look at architecture. 
I love how you are starting to relate this to your interest in historic preservation. Can you talk a little bit more about how that's influenced your, your writing and your work? Yeah, for sure. Well, I'm definitely going to bring it here while we're in San Francisco at Heritage. But I'm already starting to do storytelling about the Haas Lilienthal House. So this house was built in 1886. And if you check my um, social, which is all attached to my website at madridfrench.com or it's sfheritage.org, you'll see some of the pictures of this house. And when people um, are attracted to a building, they identify it, but they actually create an, uh, like a personality. So the, my favorite, speaking of knives, is the Bates Mansion in Psycho. And this is the perfect time to talk about murder in a big mansion. So um, you've seen Psycho, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> How can you forget it? I know, right? Okay. And if you haven't seen it, I won't give away any spoilers, but what you want to do is realize that there are two buildings that are critically important to that, to that movie. And you'll see that the characters are constantly trapped by the architecture. The lead character, a woman named Marion, she steals some money. She hides out in a roadside motel, but she really don't want to stop there. She thinks she's safe, and maybe it didn't turn out that way. Uh, in the big mansion above, there's an identity merging of the character of Norman Bates with his mother. And the mansion actually becomes and represents the mother. Mm -hmm. And what was so great about that uh, building is that people know the Bates Mansion, and if they've never even seen Psycho, they don't know who Hitchcock is, they, they still recognize that identity of this big mansion over at the motel. And I'm sure you've all seen it before. Uh, so that's what really inspired me. I was like, how do you do that? That movie is over 60 years old. How do you put that kind of powerful image inside a building? And that's how the whole book started, really, with Psycho. <laughs> And um, who worked, do you know who worked with Hitchcock to create these um, these different buildings for his film settings? Right, okay, so there's, so some people say, in my book, this is split up into five chapters. So there's mansions and motels, uh, deadly skyscrapers, and uh, villains' lairs, which are so much fun, and then also some background on the people who developed these ideas. And I really only focus on the um, Hitchcock's movies from the mid 20th century. So it'll be Rear Window, The Birds, Vertigo, Psycho, and North by Northwest. Just a little bit of rope thrown in there and some of the other things, Strangers on the Train, you know. Oh, but, um, but so what it is, is it was, what I discovered, it was the team that he was surrounded by was completely focused during this extremely creative period he had. And so you would have uh, George Tomasini with cinematography. We'd have Robert Boyle in production design. Um, Joseph Stefano uh, wrote the script for Psycho. You have Bernard Herrmann doing that great score for all of those movies. And um, then you'd have uh, Saul Bass doing the titles. And you'll see that the architecture is just in every single one of those things. So uh, beginning in North by Northwest, Saul Bass was a famous graphic designer. He showed the skyscraper and the lines of the titles are actually running through the, the building. So if you start watching Hitchcock regularly this period, almost every one of those movies starts with the building. So Vertigo starts with a uh, deadly chase across the skyscrapers of San Francisco. Uh, in Psycho, it opens up on Phoenix, a vision of downtown Phoenix, and you go in the window of a CD hotel. And uh, North by Northwest begins with the picture of, of, that, of that skyscraper. And I'm not sure where the bird starts, but check out these movies and see where, where you, you'll see the architecture. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. That's what's so great about it. Right. So you spoke a little bit about some of the chapters of your books um, kind of broken up by thematic, but are those the different types of buildings or are you focusing on any other type of buildings in your book? Mm -hmm. So in my book, I hint at a work that I'm continuing. So I just recently finished a article about the architecture of entrapment in anime. So what I'm trying to do is take the ideas that I first posited in the Hitchcock book and then apply it to different directors and different types of architecture. So I started studying the Kowloon Walled City uh, in Hong Kong, which has been demolished by now, but which appears repeatedly in, anim in anime productions like Ghost in the Shell, they refer to it. Um, I looked at Tatami, um, I think it's called Tatami Galaxy, it's a television series. So you can, you can extrapolate this idea to different types of architecture. 
but I mostly specialize on the kind of architecture that really kills you in the movie. So I like villains, layers, and, and skies falling from skyscrapers. So I think you you did didn't you just get one of your articles published in uh, Vanity Fair? I did a nice lead in, Carolyn. I have a copy. It's the one with Olivia Wilde. And in that we talk about uh, we talk about uh, the villain's lair. And of course, so many people love this. It's the uh, Van Dam House from North by Northwest. It's so funny because I still get questions from people. They'll say I posted uh, the other day like about the villain's lair. And someone said, oh, I was just at Mount Rushmore and I didn't go see that building, which is how real these become. It was, spoiler alert, it was not a real building. It was constructed by Robert Boyle on the MGM set and is mostly uh, matte paintings. And what about, didn't you also just write recently for AARP? Oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so I did AARP, I just wrote an article, an online article about the top 10 scariest books, which is a great segue. Let's get back to the bookstores. Uh, the top 10 scariest books of all time. And I didn't want to just focus on uh, 21st century, 20th century work. So I went all the way back. And this is where history is so compelling. And bookstores, of course, are amazing places of discovery, just like old mansions. And I went all the way back. Um, and everyone, you can find this on um, it's AARP.org, but you will find the link to a free Google book. And it's a 17th century uh, accounting. It's sort of one of the first paranormal researchers that actually wrote all of his documentation down. But it's from 1680. And I believe his name is Joseph Glanville. And he wrote about, you know, ghosts that would pull your sheets at night and uncover your feet. He wrote about a, a woman who was murdered and her spirit came back to reveal the murderer. Uh, and they eventually were executed for her murder after the ghost revealed the location of her body. He talks about uh, one is the famous, the drummer of Tedworth, which was a poltergeist activity. Um, the, so he just kept drumming and drumming the poltergeist until everybody left the house. But this is the absolute foundation of modern horror. It goes back further than that, for sure. But you can see it already being written down, this paranormal investigator experience, even in 1680. Have you have you uncovered any other kind of mysteries through your research for these different publications and articles? Oh right. Okay, so I like to call this the mysticism of Alfred Hitchcock. So there's no uh, you know, there's it's just funny things that you stumble upon while you're doing research on him, and then they connect in this strange way. And it's like this is very mysterious. Uh, how this. Uh, particular director was just uh, connected to so many things. So I found out doing research in San Francisco about vertigo. At the culmination of vertigo, there's a scene at the Hotel Empire, which is here in San Francisco and has been renamed the Hotel Vertigo. Uh, it's closed at the moment. But um, what I found out, there's a shop clerk that lived at the Hotel Empire. And if you've watched Vertigo, the main character is a shop clerk. She works at iMagnet. And there was a shop clerk. She lived at Hotel Empire. She took the elevator to the top and she jumped from the top of the Hotel Empire. She didn't leave a note. She had her little newspaper and her keys and that's it. And she fell to the ground uh, right on the very sidewalk where Jimmy Stewart and um, Alfred Hitchcock were filming just one month later. And it was a very small piece in the newspaper, but I've traced uh, her name was Helen Zerfla, and I've traced her activities, and she lived in San Francisco, and she was 45 and considered, and she wasn't married, uh, and she worked, she couldn't get a job, and so, she, uh, you know, anyways, terrible tragedy, terrible tragedy, but what was so interesting about it is the whole context of Vertigo is about falling and jumping from the killer skyscraper, and so these two things came together and never been uh, found out before, brand new discovered. There are a lot of fans here in San Francisco of Alfred Hitchcock and especially of the film Vertigo. And I'm sure that we'll have a lot of fans of your work here. And I'm sure there in Miami, everyone in the bookshop is also looking forward to ordering your book and finding out more. Do you have oh, anything thanks. else that you've been working on lately aside from getting ready for the big move to the West Coast? Oh, right. So I, I'm living in Orlando right now and I, I will be moving to San Francisco in December. I did want to mention in the book, there's something else in there that's never been seen before. Uh, while I was doing research on Hitchcock, I tried to find all new images for the book. So there's things in there that you haven't seen. And I spent a lot of time on the photographs. 
there's one photograph in there that has never been published before of a partially disrobed Alfred Hitchcock. And it's very interesting. And he just doesn't have a shirt on. That's, I make it sound like that it is. But it was taken by a famous life photographer named Gordon Park. So he's an African American photographer. And I contacted the archive, like, you know, do you have a picture I saw of Alfred Hitchcock in Life magazine? And they said, oh, we don't have that and we can't find it, but would you like to use this photo? And it was a photo that's never been seen before. It's in the book, it's the first color plate. So you won't want to miss that for sure. Um, yeah, if there's any questions, Sebastian, I can go on and on, or we can start doing some questions too. If you want to start posting, um, oh, I see there's some questions in there. Let me see what I can see. Oh, that's my favorite part about writing about horror. Okay, great. Um, well, I'm actually kind of a scaredy cat, which is so funny. So we had Mayhem Mansion here last night, and I went on the tour of the haunted house. And even though I helped set it up, I still jumped at all the jump scares. <laughs> My favorite part about writing about horror is connecting the experiences that I'm writing about to real historic movements. You know, it's more like historical horror. So I'll go back to that 17th century and find the ghosts and how did they talk about it? And it's always a surprise how really people haven't changed that much, uh, even since the 1600s. They still are worried about ghosts and knocks in, in the house. And, and this is a five-story Victorian with double height attic. And so it is very, there's a lot of noises in here, but that's one of my favorite parts about writing. Um, I think the next question is, why did you choose to focus on Hitchcock? I would say that it was Psycho. I mean, Psycho really inspired me because the power of the mansion and I just was like, how do I capture that power? So I started to look at Hitchcock, his team. It's very important to look at the team behind the film because just like a building, uh, the architect did not lay every brick. So it's the same thing with film directors. He, his team really came together. They were the most creative uh, people he was surrounded by. And so I thought, let me just keep investigating and keep investigating. And it took about six years to write the book through COVID and all the archives closed right in the middle. Uh, so, but Hitchcock, um, the other thing about him real quick is that he perseveres. And I say that Hitchcock is like Hollywood Shakespeare. And the reason I put it that way is because every generation needs to watch the movies, read about him, and the, or I Brown and Poe, the same, the literature, every generation has to develop their own perspective on discover it and rediscover it and how do you see it within the context of your current life so i'm definitely interpreting hitchcock from the position of, of a latina person who was raised in los angeles on the movies of the 60s 70s and 80s and uh, probably a lot of you out there if you're around my age remember seeing all the um, like horror castle on Saturday afternoon TV, they would show all this horror. So children actually were exposed and I inappropriately went to see Jaws with my grandpa when I was 10 and I never really got over that. Um, so anyway, so children, especially when they were my age in the 60s, were exposed to horror yeah. a lot. <laughs> and so I think but that informed I it. think that's interesting what you're talking about, each uh, generation kind of reinterpreting it. And we had uh, Alfred Hitchcock, we had Vertigo shown at the Castro Theater, the historic uh, movie theater, 100 years old here in San Francisco. And they had um, interventions from film studies uh, departments and others, but just talking about kind of with the Me Too movement and others and mm -hmm. cancel culture and other, you know, newer perspectives on Hitchcock that were coming up as the, you know, in our new modern times. Oh, for sure. I mean, he's a very complicated artist and there was a lot of, of layers. And so to, uh, to actually focus on the architecture, I had to sort of put the other issues to just side. to the side so I can focus on getting the scholarship out. But as it develops, what I'm trying to do is work with um, other women who want to start a podcast about uh, Alfred Hitchcock. Oh, and um, if you've seen uh, Queer for Fear, it's on um, Netflix, I believe, right now, which is looking at all of the concepts of horror from the queer perspective. Mm -hmm. So, And I'd like to bring more Hispanic and Latina people into that because we, you know, all of us really know how to get scared. <laughs> Uh, so um, I think there's so much room for all the voices and I've always just welcomed everybody to, you know, 
feel like you can comment on these things, feel like you can have your own perspective because everyone has a, right. has a We all need to be, you know, more at that listening to other perspectives concerned. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there's another question that says, That's why do you think um, people are attracted to horror to suspense as a genre? Do you think it's a healthy interest? Yes, <laughs> let us discuss that. So this is often an active conversation on Twitter. So a lot of people, there's a new, uh, the, what we're calling it now is um, comfort horror, which is not what you think it is, but it's the same way as if I went and saw Sound of Music every year, uh, just to remind me of something and make me feel good. There is, I think okay. genuinely for me, I can only speak to, about my own self, it is very healthy for me to, to watch horror and to read about horror. There's a, a, a release, so when I'm in, uh, absorbed by a story, I can't think of anything else. So I went and saw Barbarian, which I just enjoyed uh, immensely in the theater. And the whole time you're in the theater, I'm not thinking about email or I forgot to do this or where did I put my keys? It's all about being in the moment. And so that's what I would say, that, that horror could be a healthy interest, just like, you know, maybe I like to be on the exercise bike. It's just a different way for people to express that. Um, so the next one seems similar. Yeah, but okay, so the what, question is, yeah, do you want to read it? Yeah, what does horror and suspense say about the human condition? Well, I think what's interesting about that, there's two things. One, it has remained basically unchanged. The stories have remained the same for hundreds or even thousands of years. So I think it's basic part of storytelling that I think humans have real fear about their environment, whether it was, you know, in, in the in earlier times, you know, before we could even write, I had a feeling that people were telling stories. Just, you know, and maybe intentionally scared each other. Hitchcock had yeah, a rock art. Yeah, <laughs> rock art, yeah. But Hitchcock had an interesting perspective, and I observed this last night at our Haunted Mansion event. It's a Mayhem Mansion. When you scare somebody, first they're like scared, and then they laugh. And so Hitchcock's, t his story is that he waited outside the theater when Psycho was playing, and people were genuinely, that movie was very traumatic for a lot of people. And you could hear the screaming in the theater, but when they come out of the theater, everybody was laughing. And it's the same thing with roller coaster. So on my social, I put all my roller coaster photos because I'm usually like <laughs> primal scream, uh, but it's pretty much just a release. So I think with, um, you know, with the horror and the human condition, you do see a rise in horror when the world is more chaotic. And I do think that's because people are trying to control their environment and their fear. Very interesting. Yeah. So here's a question. Why do you choose to use the word architecture to write about suspense? Oh, okay. Well, there, the, the whole thing is about architecture. So I'm an architectural historian and it's taking suspense. But, you know, I, I've, I was just telling Carolyn that I've worked in many, many for real haunted houses as far as I'm concerned with noises and things and uh, since the 80s when I was a secretary actually in Salt Lake City for some lawyers I worked in a giant mansion um, and in the 80s you could still find all the Victorian stuff in the at in the basement and the attic and so that's where it started so I chose to write about architecture and suspense just because that's where I come from I'm always in an interest in building I just thought that'd be a good way to so start. Here's an interesting question from Catherine Zip. She oh, says, can you say a little bit more about why Hitchcock used modern buildings specifically? Does that type of architecture mean something specific to him? Right. Okay. So thank you, Catherine. Um, hey, how you doing? So Catherine and I went to the University of Virginia, and I will be at UVA um, on Halloween day speaking at the School of Architecture. But in terms of modernism, what uh, Hitchcock did with modernism was just groundbreaking in Hollywood. He was the first person to, well, first we have to step back to like 1920s, 1930s films. So we'd have Dracula and The Mummy and everybody. They would be in a big cobweb mansion. And then the villains started to get a little more suave, like, a, like Captain Nemo, right? You know, they're James Mason, they're very handsome. And so the production designers would get the scripts and you can't put a very handsome, you know, suave villain of the 1950s in an old cobweb mansion. So suddenly the architecture wasn't working anymore. So what um, Hitchcock and his team did, Robert Boyle with North by Northwest specifically, was they paired the modern villain with the modern house. This changed everything. 
So as I as I researched, you know, the Van Dam House in North by Northwest, which is the home of the villain, it has this panoptic experience above the valley uh, with all glass walls on one side, but all stone on the other. So villains are always hiding and then they're completely open. So with that building, it's based on a Frank Lloyd Wright uh, house, um, more specifically Falling Water, which is in Pennsylvania, which Catherine wrote about. She wrote a great book about Falling Water. And so you put these things together. Mid-century modern was very popular. Where is our villain going to live? He's going to live in basically an unapproachable modern house. Well, the thing works so great that um, everybody does it now. So now the vampires in Twilight live in a glass house which is the full circle and every villain from uh, James Bond took off on it. So you'll see Sean Connery in all types of modernist places um, designed by uh, John Lautner in particular. He did a lot of houses for families that ended up being villain slayers. So I investigate that. How did a modern building for a family turn into the icon for a villain? And that's, that's what's in my book. So as we come off of Hispanic Heritage Month, um, how, here's a question asking, how has your Latina background influenced your interest in horror and suspense? Well, I think, you know, that's based on storytelling, really. So, you know, the oral history, every culture has their own oral, oral history. And my dad would tell me that, you know, I think this is based on the La Llorona uh, with the witch in the water. So my dad would tell me stories. He grew up in East LA and they would, as a little boy, they would say, if you go near the water, the witch will grab you, right? And there's no witch in the water, but what they were doing was using these stories to see, help kids behave. And you can, if you look up um, like Boogeyman, you'll see Boogeyman in every single culture, just different names, same idea. And I find it so interesting. So I try to take my position as a person born in Los Angeles and um, my grandmother was a Yaqui Indian and my um, and uh, my grandfather was Spanish. Uh, and then my mother's from the Midwest and I kind of put all that together. And then I said, well, what does that mean to me? And also growing up in LA, I think had a huge influence in what I'm looking at architecturally because uh, I grew up in that 1960s period of rebirth for modernism. And it really influenced my ideas of architecture. Thank you. So April Roberts sent a question asking, can you tell us a bit about putting together the book? The photos are amazing. The photo of Hitchcock and the roses, she highlights. I've never seen some of them. Yeah, thanks for asking April. Uh, so the images, I try to make that. So if you're in a hurry and you're at Books and Books and you just paw and you're just like going through the pages, you will still understand what I'm talking about. So I very carefully constructed the, the images as the story so you can just say oh i understand where we're going with this i did do i included a lot of um, stills from the film so you can see uh, one thing that we don't remember is that a lot of these hitchcock films were actually what we would say in the vault for decades um, and i've seen uh, robin wood who is a hitchcock scholar referred to it he said i hadn't seen rear window for eight years and I scribbled some notes in the theater. So for so long, these, these movies were locked up. Um, and then we have, now we have VCR, but my VCR, oh my God. Did I just go back in the past? I just time traveled. I just time traveled. Uh, so but you can rewatch streaming everything and you can stop things. So that has actually made my scholarship possible because I can go through and I can stop and then I can examine everything that they put in the scene. And what does this mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? And I like to take the buildings from the movies and then I look for the real life example that inspired the production designers. And that's when just everything opened up and there was so much uh, great information. I love that. So I didn't see any more questions. So I'll just go on a little bit more about uh, is oh, that Sebastian? Yeah. I'm sorry. That's fine. Yeah, please go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I, I, I think everybody probably gets the idea. I'll just say a couple more little things that are really fun. So when you're going through the book, like keep an eye out for, uh, and then you go out in the landscape, right? So do a little bit of time travel like I just did with the VCR. Uh, when you're walking down the street and you're looking around and you start to notice architecture, you'll find yourself transported, really, the same way you are in a great book or a great movie. 
But as you look around, you'll see it. You can see this is 1920, this is 1950. Like who lived here, what happened here? And you can, people just love making architectural pilgrimages. I would definitely recommend make a pilgrimage to our house here, Halls Lilienthal. But go see your favorite structures and just spend some time with architecture. So many great stories behind them. Um, oh yeah, Sebastian, you can come on. Where are you at the coffee shop? <laughs> Okay, uh, we have one final question, which I, I don't know if you guys saw. Oh, modern. Oh, okay. Yes, let's do that. Okay, let's do. Okay, here's the question. What about modern horror directors and who owes a lot to Hitchcock? And oh, my Halloween recommendations for books for grownups. Of course, thank you for asking that. Um, so if we looking at Hitchcock, you know, how did he influence everybody? I see it everywhere. Once you wait, once you see, you can't unsee. So, um, did you see any? Do you watch scary movies, Carolyn? Maybe not. <laughs> it's actually hard to work in a scary house and watch scary movies. Maybe a little too much. Um, but so, let's even take a Jordan Peele, for instance. So, you'll see Jordan Peele's storytelling is very similar to what Alfred Hitchcock does. And he just absorbs you entirely in the environment. And if you spend time with these films and watch them repeatedly, you'll get more information every time you watch it. So Jordan Peele would be, the same say, no, recently came out about an alien invasion. And he has a big farmhouse on the hill with a classic scene, I will spoil you, with blood running down the entire house. And I was like, is a psycho. It's like a reinterpretation of that psycho mansion on the hill where there's a disaster where you think you're going to be safe and really you're still in danger. Uh, you'll see a lot of it um, in the new movies coming out. Um, I just watched The Watcher, for instance, which is based on a real story. Have you been watching that? No, my daughter's watching oh, it. Oh gosh, it is great. It's by Ryan Murphy and of course he's a master of horror. And it's all about the house and then how people's relationship with the house, they write love letters to the house, but then the house is not kind, you know, to people, the house will, will kill you uh, for, your, for, your, for your obsession. So you can, you can find these things everywhere. And then if you want to get to the bookstore, get to the bookstore. Uh, some of, there's some new um, uh, great uh, books out and I wrote about these, uh, so Mexican Gothic is a great one. Also, you can rely on some classics like Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter is one of my favorites, uh, which looks at Abraham Lincoln uh, out there. Uh, that's written by Seth Graham uh, Smith. And also, let's see what else did I write? Oh, of course, I just watched The Omen again last night. Isn't that a funny coincidence? And that is was um, turned into a book, which is really scary. So if you go to that AARP article about the top 10 scariest books of all time, those are all books I actually read, and I uh, suggest that you try some of them out because they're genuinely scary. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to both of you. It was really a pleasure to have you uh, on for this event. And uh, Books and Books is just really, really honored. Really happy to have both of you. Um, and I just wanted to say a few words. Um, you know, I wanted to say thank you to the Miami Book Fair and to all of you for watching and for reading. Um, I hope you will support Christine and independent bookstores by ordering your copy of The Architecture of Suspense, The Built World in the Films of Alfred Hitchcock. The link below at the bottom of your screen and also to check out the article. Um, and or you can uh, pop into any one of our stores in person in Miami. I hope you have a great rest of your day and, uh, and your weekend. And thank you so much. Thanks, Sebastian. Thank you. Bye-bye.